And we're live. We are indeed live. Saints fans, I hope you've had a brilliant long Anzac Day weekend on a beautiful Tuesday night. I'm pleased that you have the time to join us. Max, how are you doing? Yeah, fantastic weekend. Um, always, always great to get up on the Blues. Five and one. Good times keep rolling at Saints TV. And we're going to be joined by a special guest shortly. But before we get on to that, how was your weekend, Jordan? Oh, my weekend was lovely. Thank you very much, Max, for asking. Very restful, very relaxing. Good to, you know, have some time off uni, as I'm sure you can appreciate not having to go in. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah, great weekend. Made even better by the fact that St Kilda won. Um, obviously an important day today and it's important to acknowledge the importance of, of the day. Um, I was lucky, fortunate enough to be able to go to the dawn service at the Australian War Memorial this morning at 4.30am. Um, so apologies if I look a bit tired. But yeah, that was that was a really, uh, really special um, service and something that, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity and, and something that was very, very moving. Um, but speaking of Anzac Day, I think it would be, you know, I think it would be remiss of us not to not to acknowledge also the the Saints that have given their given their um that have served in the in the war. Um so we're just gonna show their names. We're gonna pause for a moment and show their names on screen. Yeah, these are the all St Kilda serving in World War One, World War Two, and I believe also in Vietnam, but definitely World War One and World War Two. So we thank you, uh, thank the Saints players that have um, served for this country, and we thank their families. We also thank everyone currently serving, um, as it is the ultimate sacrifice to defend your country and and um, uphold everything that that generations um, have sought to protect. Yeah, lovely stuff, Max, too right. But it would also be remiss of us not to mention the the fantastic game that was played today. Obviously, you know, this isn't a Collingwood or Essendon fan channel, but, geez, it was great for the, great for the footy world to see what a spectacle that was, wasn't it? Yeah, that was an unreal game. That fourth quarter was electrifying. I don't think... Essendon kicked a goal. They were Collingwood was something like twenty three points down, twenty six points down. Um, it just shows that we kept it kept a, a game to Collingwood within six points. So we're we're right up there with the best. We've taken it to the fourth place Carlton, and we've beat Essendon. So hopefully that's only only good things for St Kilda um, in the future. Yep, um, like you said, electrifying fourth quarter. Even the third quarter when the Dons got in a roll, that was just very. Fantastic to watch as a neutral supporter. Um, mm. But also what was good to see was Darcy Moore's very moving speech after the game. I thought he delivered an exceptional speech, um, not just acknowledging, you know, the Collingwood and Essendon players and all those involved with their football club, but also the men and women that have served for this country and the families of those men and women that have served for this country. And I thought it was just a terrifically delivered speech. So well done to Darcy Moore. I think he deserves a, a, a big congratulations to... You know, he certainly earned my respect, and it seems like Collingwood have just moved from one commendable captain in, in Scott Pendlebury to another. Um, yeah, so great choice for them to pick Darcy Moore, and, and congratulations to the Collingwood Footy Club for, for winning today. On a different note, Max, I did have some some internet issues over the weekend. I did have a, a bit of a struggle with Google. Oh, no. What have you got in yeah. store? Yeah, so I was I was doing a, a group assignment and I was looking up images of of God, and <laughs> this this is what came up. <laughs> so I'm a bit perplexed. I'm not sure if you're you're any good with technology, but <laughs> maybe you can help me out. Maybe that's an issue with my device. But yeah, it seems like Ross Lyon is just. We are on, we are on top of the ladder, but also on top of the footy world at the moment, and he seems to be our lord and saviour. Yeah, no, absolutely. And he's supporting Cass Enright, Harvey Hayes, and then Goddard taking care of the uh, the 18 to 22-year-olds, I believe it is, at Linton Street. So 
look, I, I don't think we've had a better off season in terms of coaching panel. Um, really looks like we've got a, a solid core in our coaching department for the next four to, to however many years. Um, no, nah, and I'm just excited that this is already already look off to a good start. So I couldn't imagine if we went the other way, maybe people would be questioning our decision as, as getting Ross back into the into Linton Street. But no, couldn't be happier as a Saints fan with both on and off the field um, antics, I guess. Yep, too right. So we do, obviously, a lot of you have joined for GT and we, we do acknowledge that he is he is coming very shortly. But just in the meantime, while we're waiting for, for Big Grant to come and join us, how about we chat a little bit about the Carlton game? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, I might kick it to you, Jordan, to start with. Um, who is your player of the game? My player of the game, it was unbelievable to do this in in thinking, yeah, preparing for the show, to think about how well-rounded the performance was on, on Sunday Arvo because it was really difficult to pick a player of the game for me. I would say just getting over the line was the silver service Dan Butler. He was terrific in the three goals that he scored, but also the tackles inside 50 and the effort that he puts in. He's been, he was subjected to a fair bit of criticism last year, but I think he's quietly gone about his business very well this season. And yeah, Sunday was just evidence of that. Three goals. I'm not sure how many touches he had, how many tackles he had, but just it seemed to me, yeah, from my perspective, that he had a terrific game. How about you, Max? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely spot on about Dan Butler. We, what a recruit he was in 2020, obviously all Australian. And then since then, he might have dipped off just a, just a tiny bit. But look, he's... His pressure has always been at the elite at the elite level, top five in the AFL for the last three years, I believe, in pressure acts. Um, all of our small forwards are firing. Jack Higgins, even though he had a quiet one, his rundown tackle in the middle of the ground, he wasn't doing that two years ago or if he was even at Richmond. Um, Brad Hill, I think, is playing some of the best footy in his of his career. Yes, he might not be getting as, as many touches in the high 20s, but all his touches are now becoming impactful. Uh, and Jade Gresham looks like he's he sort of had a bit of a kick up the arse and he looked like he had a great game on the weekend. And hopefully that that those four smalls, they they really work together. And if two or three of them are firing each week, then that makes up for the one that, that may not be. Um, going back to your question, though, who was my player of the game? For me, it was Jack Sinclair. He's clearly solidified himself as the best halfback in the game. And to have such a, a versatile asset out of defence that can also play as an explosive mid. Um, wow. It's, yeah, to think however many years into his career he is, eight, nine years, now he's just playing his best footy. It's, yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, I thought that Sinks obviously had a fantastic game and I think the the coaches' votes, which we'll show on screen now, um, I think that is evident of of the game that, that he played. Clearly both... Both um, Michael Voss and Ross Lyon thought he was the the player of the game. And as you'll see, you've got our two smalls in Dan Butler and Brad Hill up there as well with three and two votes for, uh, respectively, sorry. So, look, I'm not sure how Carlton wants to go out playing their footy. They can handball the, the pill as much as they like, but when you get 100 disposals more than another team, Usually that should lead to a few more inside 50s and a few more um, shots at goal. But my goodness, I think seven of the top eight disposal getters were all Carlton players. Yeah. And just like we were saying before, it was a really well-rounded performance. We've got a couple of comments in here. Xavier's noted how good it was to see Butler stand up after Higgins copped a hard tag mm. of Newman. Yeah, Nick, Higgins was really, um, his performance probably wasn't as, well, I'd say it was pretty impactful, actually, given the way he was able to, to to let Butler do his thing. Newman played pretty well, but Higgins was doing getting the balls to ground and doing what he needed to do to, um, you know, to keep the play moving. I thought he played pretty well. Also, Brad Hill. There's been a couple of comments about him. Christopher's noted how good he was. So has Guy, and Beth also has noted how good Brad. Brad was. Max, what impressed you the most from the Carlton game? I've just seen a comment from the guy, and it's it's Hunter Clark. He has been a revelation in the midfield. We all know, yep, yeah, that's the comment. He's 
uh, he is a midfielder, right? He's so classy with the ball. He's so skilled and very steel side bottom esque. He can kick on both feet and you can't tell the difference. There's times where he just looks like a natural left footer and to be able to operate out of both both sides of the midfield when when exiting a ruck or uh, sorry, a contest, it's yeah, such an asset and he's only gonna get better. This is what he's sixth game playing full time mid. So hopefully gets more comfortable in there, gets a big bit bet bit oh my god, I can't speak, sorry. Uh, a slightly bigger tank so we could run out games a bit more. But yeah, wowee, he was yeah, he was something special on the weekend. Yep. And for me, my, the the thing that was well most impressive was the fact that we're able to in the fourth quarter once we had the game done, was not only, you know, take it back a year, uh, notch down a couple of gears and sort of rest up a little bit and while maintaining the the game and avoid a a situation like we just saw with Essendon. Um, where Collingwood ran over the top of them in the last quarter. But, yeah, just take the foot off the gas and not lose it. Mm. That that really allowed us to, you know, not go no, as hard as we – well, as hard as we probably could have at Carlton in the last quarter and get some, you know, important rest and make sure, yeah, we're fully rested before the big game on – on th- um, sorry, excuse me, Friday night. Um, <laughs> you know, Port Adelaide played on – they played on Saturday, didn't they? Yeah, they played the – the undermanned Eagles, so they've got a another day of rest and advantage for them. So I think that was a really good decision to to sort of control the game and, and slow it uh, to slow it down, and, you know, and not not go as hard as we were. Yeah. Um, well, that's enough about the Carlton game, I suppose. As you, as most of you are aware, we do have a a special guest who probably shouldn't need an introduction. But we'll get one anyway. This man has played 72 games for St Kilda and coached St Kilda from mid-2001 to 2006, including consecutive preliminary finals, and has been very active in his support for the St Kilda Football Club, not just as a coach, but, yeah, since since 2006. So without further ado, I welcome the man himself. Ooh. Grant, how are you, mate? Greetings. How are we, guys? Not too Great, bad. Thank you, very well, very well. All righty, so we're going to get this kicked off. We'll get cracking into it straight away. Um, what has impressed you most about the uh, the 2023 St Kilda as opposed to years gone by? Uh, probably most impressive is uh, the fact that um, we've stopped wasting time and um, we've wasted a decade. You know, like uh, just a decade has gone by since Ross was last there. And uh, um, clubs that are in the premiership business, <clears throat> they don't waste time. They make whatever decisions are required to be in the premiership business. And what I think we are now is by virtue of our actions, because you can't just talk about it. you got to you got to act. And um, we're in the premiership business. And... Um, uh, you know, understanding that last year we were probably the same, were we 5 1 or whatever we were? Mm. Um, so, you know, we don't want to get in front of ourselves like uh, many St Kilda fans can do. But, but uh, Ross is a, a really strong um, disciplinarian manager of strategy, manager of standards. Uh, engagement, connection, all of those vitally important ingredients, and uh, and he he won't tolerate um, anything less than the players have signed on for. So he manages them towards that, and that's why St Kilda can get rid of its inconsistency, uh, which has been a major frustration for us all. You know, we show flashes of brilliance uh, week to week, quarter to quarter, uh, contest to contest. Uh, whereas, you know, I think the first five or six games this year, we've been very consistent with our attitude and very consistent with our effort. We haven't been getting all of those um, over-the-back goals. Um, you know, Higgins and Butler are contributing up the ground uh, and are different players, uh, more team orientated. So I'm seeing a lot of really good signals that um, top teams have. Are we there? No, I don't think we are. I mean, I think we're a, a bit short. And we've 
we've uh, started very well and we've got under people's guards and all the rest of it and the season's going to get tougher as it goes on but uh, you know um, if we make finals this year which we should uh, that, that, that'll be a, a good stepping stone and if we get some of the uh, um, list decisions right uh, both uh, exit and entry next year um, well you know um, I'm sure we can take another step forward but it's it's really exciting, but it's not that <laughs> it's not that difficult. I mean, if you, if you get sort of great people involved, well, amazing things can happen. And um, and uh, Ross has shown that he has a strong ability to do the things required to be successful. Yeah, spot on. Um, just on that, Grant, uh, which player do you think's made the most the the biggest improvement under? Under Ross, you mentioned that, you know, you get the right guy in, good things tend to happen. Which guy do you think's made the, the, the biggest improvement on the field under under Ross? Uh, for two reasons, I don't f- feel like I want to answer that. One is because St Kilda's made an art form of highlighting individuals its whole history. That's, that's part of our problem. And secondly, I think it's been a very evenly balanced incremental improvement from everyone across the board. Even Callum Wilkie, who was playing really well, um, he's taken another step forward this year, you know, with added responsibility of the captaincy. Surprise, surprise. So, um, uh, you know, I think um, uh, it's not any real single individual. I just think there's been a, you know, a, a I don't know what the number is. Is it 5%? Is it 25%? I don't know. But there's been a percentage increase in improvement across the board. But most importantly, uh, as a team. So it's the team facets that I look at because they're the key indicators for me is, is everyone connected? Do they love being together? Do they Are they on a journey together? Um, you know, all of that stuff jumps out at me when I watch them play. I mean, you know, I used to say all the time that, Football is not about football. It's an expression of who you are, what you stand for, and who you represent. And you don't have to know, you don't have to know uh, Lenny Hayes personally to know what sort of person he is, or mm. you don't have to know uh, Stephen Milne, you know, um, uh, to know what sort of person Milne is. You know, he, he's a chatterbox, he's a cheeky little bugger, and all the rest of it. I mean. <laughs> Uh, so we display the sort of personality and the sort of per- people we are with our actions on the football field. And what I'm seeing at the moment is a very strong, united uh, team that rely on each other, depend on each other, and have got a really strong sense of trust at the moment. And I don't, I, I haven't seen that for a decade. Yeah, just just on that trust, is that something you sort of noticed uh, your time as the head coach of the Saints? Did was, was there a lot of trust among the playing group and not just the trust within the playing group? I guess that also connection to from players to coaches to management, et cetera. <laughs> You're going well until you said the last bit. Um, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of trust out, so uh, up in the management side, I can assure you. But, uh, from within the football unit, there was enormous trust. You know, the football department had a lot of the staff, um, um, most of our staff and uh, the team, uh, it was uh, unbending trust, you know, we, and we loved being together. You know, we, we worked very, very hard at building a, a, a great environment and a strong culture to foster development and growth and maturity. Because we, we had a lot of young players that had just started their careers and we, we were trying to accelerate their maturity so they were great players at 20, 21, 22 rather than waiting until they were 23, 24, 25, uh, which back in the day, 20 years ago, that didn't automatically happen. You used to have to play 50 games and be 24 or 5 before you could show your best. But I think we showed that guys like um, Revolt and Kaczynski and Ball and Del Santo and, and um, Xavier Clark and... Um, 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 Matty Maguire and all, 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 all Lee Montagna, all these guys, you know, they they were playing great footy at twenty twenty one, and a little bit before their time, which probably, you know, in in hindsight, uh, we weren't quite ready, and we performed incredibly well in 04 and 05 and 06 but um, we're probably the the more ready we became, the more injury. Um, 
prone we seem to be. It was, you know, we're more ready, obviously, in 06 and 05, but uh, in 05 and 04, but 04, we had a breakout season because uh, everyone was fit and healthy pretty much until the end of the year. And, uh, yeah, so you need a bit of luck in, the, in these things as well. But um, um, trust was a really key ingredient of, of the whole club back then. Uh, GT, you mentioned that, um, you know, obviously we came pretty close in, in 2004 and 2005. If there was a, a player in the current side that you could, you know, take out and, and travel back in time 20 odd years to stick them in that, that 04 or 05 team, who would, who would you pick? Oh, can I have two? Um, it, 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 <laughs> you most certainly can have two. You wouldn't get them, but um, so I'll have two. Um, one would be Marshall because we just didn't have a ruckman. As much as we tried, we tried to get Ottens, nearly had him. We tried to get Cox and, and nearly had him. Um, we just couldn't nail a, um, a um, high-caliber ruckman. And because of that, um, you know, we had guys who just weren't, I don't think they mind me saying, they weren't great footballers, but they were tall. And, um, um, you know, they competed hard, but, you know, they weren't, you know, they're not sort of uh, um, highly decorated uh, AFL players. But so Marshall would have been really handy for us. And the other one is Callum Wilkie. And the, the reason I say that is because no one talks about this, but the biggest... Uh, loss we had uh, wasn't necessarily the injuries to to, to Hamill or to um, um, Kaczynski or to Ball or or any of those guys. I mean, I think I think Cozzy in the 123 games I coached, Cozzy and Rui played together less than 40 times. Um, but the biggest loss we had was Luke Penny, and no one thinks about that. But Luke Penny was in all Australian form um, at that point in time. You guys. Look as though he might have even been born back then, but um, uh, Luke Luke was uh, in fantastic form, and he was taking the key forwards, which allowed us to play Max Hudson on the uh, on the small guys. And there were a lot of really good young uh, small players in the AFL, whether it was a Matera or or, or um, even you know yeah you know, the Snyders and the and the Wanganines and these guys who got off the chain in those prelim finals. Um, um, but when Luke left, it sort of left a, a really big hole and someone like a Callum Wilkie down back to release Max would have been great and support Goose McGuire, who was a tremendous centre-half back, uh, and uh, Marshall you know, to have a great ruckman. That would have been good too. Yeah, fitting fitting you talk about throwing Wilkie into your, your back line in 05, 06 because he hasn't missed a game, I believe, to start his AFL career and he was pretty fit and healthy at at the Sandville level, so no, I think it's pretty spot on in that. Trying to bring some, bring a bit more health to your side. Um, just moving on, you, you quickly you, you mentioned um, your role, I guess, at the Saints was was to develop the players as fast as they can. The Del Sandos, the Montagnas, the the Rewalts, Cozies. How much of a, an uh, an impact do you think your your time in develop, developing those sorts of players? Led on to the to the success in 09, 010, or oh nine ten sorry. Oh, um, <laughs> I have my own internal views on that, and I have a lot of um, uh, feedback from the players on that. But I think that's best served for other people to make that judgment. Um, uh, no other team won as many games as St Kilda in 04, 05 and 06. We were the most winningest team in the competition in those three years. Um, and whilst a lot of people at the AFL and a lot of people in the media were happy to see me go, um, it was quite an, quite an extraordinary decision based on the information at that stage, based on the, the, the success at that stage. But um, having said that, uh, you know, I think Ross has been on the record uh, saying just how how well developed and well prepared the mentally and how mature um, the playing group was and how their attitude and effort was exemplary and it was on remote control basically. So um, uh, that, that was obviously good to hear, but you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the way the playing group um, after a bit of a shaky start in 07 um, sort of um, 
got on with the job and had all of them had tremendous careers. Yeah, that's absolutely. a great answer. Oh, sorry, Maxie, go ahead. No, I was just saying. I, I think I think it really speaks volumes to you as a coach how you were able to to get the most out of that playing group in in 04 to to 06. Like, I don't think if you were at the helm, we we have the success in in the later later 2000s and then you know that decade as you mentioned before of a bit of bit of lo- uh, being a bit lost that might have been from 2000 to up until now like who who knows where we where we sit without your with your role in the St Kilda Footy Club thanks I appreciate it but um, I mean you know I'm, I'm no different to you guys I'm a I'm a just a humble Saints fan now and uh, always have been. I used to brag for Essendon, but I walked in the doors at, as a 15-year-old at St Kilda Footy Club and uh, been a mad Sainter ever since. And, um, um, you know, that's why I was determined to go back there and change the culture and get everything on track. And we nearly got there and um, um, unfortunately uh, got a bit derailed at the, at the end. At the end, But uh, nevertheless, uh, Ross took over and uh, had a real good fist, made a real good fist of it, and came agonisingly close. And then when he left, it sort of, you know, we we had a decade of um, misery. So, yeah. Well, let's let's look forward from that from that misery now, and the and even the the o four o five days. Um, obviously, the Saints are playing with a lot more pace and moving the ball quicker up the ground this year, which is pleasing to see not just from a Saints fan perspective like you, Max, or I, or anyone else watching, but also from a neutral fan perspective. Um, do you think that that's the pace and moving the ball quicker? Is that something done by the players or is it influenced purely by the coaching staff? Well, it's a combination of both because it's 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 got a lot to do with your strategic inputs, but it's also got a lot to do with your talent. And if you don't have the talent to fulfil that, um, uh, that makes it more difficult. I mean, I think one thing that impressed Ross the most when he got there um, uh, early this year is uh, is the 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 runability, if you like, of of the, of the playing group. How they were quick and they could run, and that sort of kept coming through in his interview. So. Uh, they've obviously, you know, with Lenny and uh, Harves and um, Corey and Wright, they've obviously built a, a really good uh, game plan that um, holds up. Uh, you know, obviously, very strongly focused on defence, which you need to be very good at, uh, with a with a really good blend of um, of uh, turnover offence that can hurt op- uh, opponents. And uh, um, and I think that you know they've got a reasonably good mix at the moment with the with the 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 type of talent we've got in the team because you know I don't think we're a top four talent team necessarily, um, but we show if if uh, if our opponents are a little bit off um, and, and we're a hundred percent on, we can bowl anyone over and uh, you know I think if we come somewhere five to eight that'd be a great year. If we finish top four, well. That'd be incredible. That'd be a magnificent uh, start. But uh, I think a lot of it's got to do with uh, coaching um, with the new staff there to decide a, a game plan that would be successful. And Ross has sort of given them their heads of it with that. And um, and and the second secondary to that is a is a playing list that can fulfil those uh, requirements. JT, can you paint a ball? Well, obviously, you mentioned that um, you know it's mainly a, a coaching implementation, the the fast ball movement and yeah, how we move the ball in our structure. Can you paint a picture for us in telling it's probably not quite as simple as telling players, okay, move the ball quickly. Like is it is it something like, you know, organizing where to stand or where to move when certain players have the ball in transition? Is it working on maximizing open space without the ball? Is it something like that? Or is it a, yeah, like a combination of all those things? Well, it's a, it's a combination of a whole host of things, but the, the, the fundamental of all of it is that word again, trust. Um, you trust and believe in your teammate to win the footy. You trust and believe to be in a position to support him and or, you know, to be able to receive um, the, 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 a kick from turnover and you put yourself in that dangerous position. Uh, but just not all 
raging forward like St Kilda has done in the in the past a fair bit, and it's either uh, um, you know to be frank, shit hot or shit house. It's um, there's no in between, and uh, I think we've got a good balance. But it's uh, an enormous amount of belief in the in in the in the game plan, uh, confidence from the coaching staff, and belief and trust in the in in the teammates to. Um, um, fulfil uh, what 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 the what the plans are, so it's a combination of a whole host of things. And you know, you got to remember that everyone that plays AFL footy, they're pretty talented. They've all got skill. Um, they you know they they tick that box. Um, getting them to play as a team is 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 the first task, and that's the most important one. Um, you know, you can you can you can go from being a a, a good side uh, to a great side. Uh, uh, and then get get to a good team, to a great team. Obviously, a great team will beat a great side. Um, but there's a transitional thing of camaraderie, uh, trust, uh, respect, belief, uh, buy-in, connection, all of those things which take you from being a side to a team. And there are a lot of requirements uh, to, to fulfil that. Um, but there is a transitional phase, and I think so. St Kilda has been a good side on occasions in the past, but we haven't been a good team. And I think at the moment, we're a good team. And um, we don't want to be a great side. We want to go from good team to great team. And, uh, um, you know, the rest of the year and next year and the year after will show that. You mentioned the word trust between the, the players and the coaching staff. Do you reckon um, teams are a bit overcoached now? Obviously, we saw Collingwood throughout most of last year and certainly the game today. You know, they rely a lot on intuition and trust between players in the last quarter last especially the last five ten minutes of the game and they've been really successful in doing that do you think instructional use of the footy is like a good thing or a bad thing for the game i think sides are significantly overcoached um every coach wants to make his imprimatur on the game and he wants to further his career so he spends a lot of time studying he spends a lot of time researching and the, the outcome of all of that is a lot of meetings for players, a lot of one-on-ones, a lot of um, um, situational stuff, a lot of uh, line meetings, or um, all those sorts of things. And I'm yet to hear an AFL player, and I still bump into a fair few, not just Saints players, but I bump into a fair, a fair few, um, that um, I'm yet to hear one of them say they actually enjoy during the week. Um, because it's, it's really onerous because of the coaches think they're doing a good job because that's what they do and they can't sit around doing nothing. But, um, you know, I, I, I think there's probably a day too much at the moment in the, in the players' week. They could get away with um, um, doing a bit of personal development on their own, a bit of life after footy stuff, um, 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 working on, on, on themselves for the future and controlling their own destiny. Um, and I don't think that that would um, be missed by the players, be missed by the coaches because they, they'd be sort of saying, well, what, what, what do we do? But I, I think they are over-controlled and over-coached to a significant degree, uh, 10 to 20%. And... Um, you see what McRae does with Collingwood. He lets lets the players play, and when you got really good, talented players like Dugowie and like Dacos and Moore and these guys, they know how to play footy, and you've got to let them play. And if, if I probably had a a, a, a criticism of uh, Rossi last time, was that he was too defensively minded, and he didn't utilise the skill set of the players at, he, at his disposal. Like we had some enormously talented players, mm. but because I was so hell bent on structure and strategy, they they did they you know uh, we're, we're always you know the opposition was always just a kick or two away, like we saw in those grand finals. Like you know um, you can't keep kicking eight goals and expecting to win because opponents have five five minutes of glory in every grand final. It doesn't matter how good or bad you are. We control the game and they have five minutes of glory, kick two goals, three goals. The players look up and go, gee whiz, we're, we're, we're eight points down and we've been controlling this game and it gets quite deflating. So 
I, I know that he's learned that lesson and I, and I expect the, the player's skills to be able to be utilised a bit more. And I think that's where the game is these days. Um, they're a bit robotic back in a decade ago and uh, um, they're all focused on defence and structure and strategy and minding grass and all that sort of stuff, whereas um, now it's, a, it's changed a little bit for the better. Yeah, uh, just before we throw it to the fans to ask uh, ask a few questions, I'd love to know, um, under your tenure, obviously that was the more free-flowing, guns-firing sort of footy. You let the, port, the the players play on instinct rather than rather than sort of tying them down, as you mentioned. Do you are you now surprised that you see Harves and Hayes um, in the in the head co- or not head coaching the assistant coaching roles at, at St Kilda? No, they're both quality individuals. Um... Harves has been coaching for seemingly a dozen years, um, so he's got a wealth of experience, uh, one-on-one and uh, as a mentor and uh, providing advice and feedback. Uh, uh, he'd be outstanding at that because he understands the game back to front in that regard. Um, Lenny's just a quality person who you can't help but but, but love and admire and everything else and and um, you know he brings a, a, a level of attitudinal effort um, uh, and uncompromising 100% effort sort of approach to uh, uh, his, his guys that he looks after and uh, so you know I think we're in very good hands I mean he did some assistant coaching in Sydney and uh, um, at GWS and then and then, you know, went, went away from it for a year or two and uh, had a look at some other stuff he wanted to do and now he's back into it. So he obviously missed it and he obviously loves it and uh, I think it's good for St Kilda and it was a smart decision by Ross and, and great to have Corey Enright, a premiership player, in there as well. But, uh, I think on top of all of that, we need to, we need to sort of recognise the magnificent uh, leadership of Andrew Bassett to... To have the gonads, to be frank, um, to um, make three pillar decisions, and one was a coach, one was a general manager of footy, and one was a list manager, the three most important positions at the club, and and to uh, pull the trigger on all of those and change them like he did um, has helped us to be in the position we are now, which isn't sort of... Um, hit the button it's all over stuff yet but it's actually got us on the train tracks to head in the right direction i actually feel we're in the premiership business now which i haven't felt that since ross was there last time yeah i 100 percent agree i think i think the club's done done a great job over the off season of trying to get those pillars in place to make sure the roots are set and then two three years time even next year we start looking at altering the list a little bit to, to refine it to get to that premiership um, to, to that premiership window. We're going to start throwing it to the fans now, um, if, if that's okay with you, to ask some questions. And as Jordan goes through that, we want to do a bit of trivia to fill in fill in the blank space. GT, do you know what your winning percentage was as a coach? Uh, NFI. <laughs> um, it was above 50%, if that helps you at all. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Okay, well, given I, given we only won five games in my first year, um, yeah, okay, that, that's okay. I, it must have must have been in the mid to high sixties in the last three years. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you're right. It was somewhere around that high sixties in in o four to o six. But uh, as a head coach, it was above fifty percent, and that typically gets you playing finals. It was fifty three percent as a head coach. Okay. Um, GT, we've got a question from Guy here. I'm not sure if you can see on the screen, but he's asking if you would coach again at the top level if you were offered. Guy, no. <laughs> I hope that answers your question, Guy. I've, I've, I've had my time, and um, um, it, it, what wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't sort of necessarily meant to be, but it happened how it happened. I've got great confidence in my ability to do that sort of stuff but um i've had my time and it's now uh up for others um i've got with, with eight children and our first grandchild with former saint jack nunes and my daughter jordan 
um, uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, and my business, I'm sort of um, got my focus on other things with one eye on the Saints all the time and trying to help out there wherever I can, but I, I don't have any interest in coaching AFL. And then I'll, I'll give you uh, another trivia question as Jordan, Jordan piles through the comments. There was one coach that you had a 100% win rate against. Do you have any idea who that coach is? No, I don't. Um, I can give you a hint. He is a multiple-time premiership winning coach. Um, ah, you got me. You got me. Alistair Clarkson um, oh. didn't lose a game. Didn't lose a game to him as a coach uh, in your tenure uh, at St Kilda. Okay, well there you go. <laughs> All right, GT. Peter is asking what your thoughts are on our young players: Owens, Caminiti, Filippo, and Beth's also chimed in. Not to forget about Windy and Nas. So, what are your thoughts on our young guys on the list? Yeah, I'm very impressed with them. I mean, it's uh, I don't know whether it was. Um, whether it was premeditated or just a bit of luck through the injuries that we've had, that they've got a chance as early as they have. But young kids rarely let you down. Um, if you get them in the right frame of mind and you give them a chance and give them a lot of support, they, they rarely fail you. So um, I've got a lot of time for the Caminides, um, uh, Owens, um, uh, the other one who you mentioned, just forgot. What's his uh, name? Malera? Yes, yeah. Wanganine um, Malera. I mean, I think that uh, they've all got different assets, but I love the way the, the two sort of key forwards are imposing themselves on the game and meeting the contest and and set their second and third efforts, uh, their ground level uh, support as well. If um, When the ball comes to ground, I, I think they've been tremendous. And they've, they've brought a real spirit morale to the group too. They uplift a lot of the uh, more experienced players with their enthusiasm and, and zest for the contest. So I, I think they've been really well coached and prepared by Ross. Just I'll, I'll give you one last trivia question as, as Jordan continues to, to fly through. Do you know what your biggest winning margin was? Um, during during your period at the Saints, um, oh, I think it might have been it was over a hundred points, was it? I don't... Yes, it was over a hundred points. I hold, a, I hold a Carlton one time a day, I think, um, for memory. I, I remember seeing that there was these that I don't know where it was in a record or somewhere, but it was St Kilda's biggest winning margins and St Kilda's this and St Kilda's that and. I just noticed that there were several that were in the era when when I coached, which was yes. uh, we're obviously pretty proud of. So that was good. <laughs> yeah, I think Carlton might have been your second highest. That was about 106, 110 points. The, the one I'm referring to was 2005, round 22 against the Lions. You beat them by 139 points. So two years after they've they've done their three-peat, you've absolutely given them a smacking by... God knows how many goals that is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, GT. Adams. Uh, Adams wondering who is inspiring you as a coach or a leader. Um, I, I haven't really had a, a mentor or uh, a, anyone that sort of inspired me. The thing that inspired me was my passion and. I suppose, deep-seated love of St Kilda Footy Club and my frustration at our pathetic existence over 150 years, apart from probably half a dozen years uh, where we competed ad admirably. So I, I got a lot of my, my motivation in that from taking a stand and, and saying enough's enough, um, St Kilda's a laughing stock of the competition. No one takes us seriously. We're not respected. And, <clears throat> and I was determined to um, change all that. And um, uh, I think for a decade we did that, um, you know, from sort of uh, 03, about 03, uh, we turned the corner and uh, through to when Rossi finished in, in, in 12. So we got a, a good decade out of it. And uh, <coughs> Excuse me. If, um, you know, we... Uh, had it been able to pull one or two premierships off, it would have topped it off nicely. Good answer. I like it. 
Xavier's yeah. wondering, GT, who St Kilda needs to target this year in the draft? Oh, you're asking the wrong guy. I have no idea. Um, I, n- I never, ever got involved in any of that. I let Bevo do his work and uh, I say to him, Bevo, don't don't come and tell me how to coach. I won't come and tell you how to recruit. You you select them, bring them into our, into our home and I'll look after them from there. So that's sort of how it was. We just wanted to select the best talent available and, um, uh, you know, <clears throat> where I think our shortfalls are, I think we need a, a, another tool down there to help um, uh, 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 King when he, can, when he returns. Um, I, th- I think that uh, uh, we, for whatever reason, um, well, bad selections with Petrarca and Bonham Pally, but we've avoided tank like uh, midfielders, you know, those six foot four, six foot five danger fields, Cripps, Bondon Pally, uh, Petraka, <coughs> excuse me, these guys, we seem to have avoided them and most of our midfielders are sort of quite, quite small. Uh, so I think we need to have, you know, uh, we need to find a couple of able bodied, strong uh, midfielders that can drift forward that, you know, are quite tall and, uh, uh, you know, the prototype midfielder of today. Uh, well, you mentioned that, we, um, you know, it would have been good to have another tall alongside Max. Jeremy's asking what your thoughts are on acquiring Max's twin brother, Ben. Um, well, if he's available and you can get him well and good, I'm, I um, he's obviously a highly talented player and I'm sure the brothers would love to play together. If you can pull that one off, that would be fantastic. Uh, I remember Johnny Beveridge said to me, because, uh, you know, I used to do a, a fair bit of work with Jack Rubel. Uh, whenever we went down to Tassie, you know, Jack would come and I'd do a bit of <coughs> work with him and I'd give him a few challenges. And when I'd catch up with him next time, I'd see if he'd done them and all the rest of it. And, and I remember saying to Bevo, uh, uh, why aren't we taking Jack? Uh, you know, he's obviously a quality player. And Bevo thought... I just don't think it's good to have um, the, the cousins together. Um, uh, and I said, oh, okay, Bevo, that was... Uh, <laughs> I think if he had his time again, he might have changed his mind. But <laughs> uh, with, with the king, I think it'd be fantastic if we could get him. But, uh, you know, probably be a difficult one, I think. Mm, yeah, yeah, just on that, um, getting getting two key forwards, <coughs> 200, 200 centimetres tall, a lot of analysts have said that in history has never worked. Granted, they're just analysts and not coaches. When you have an opportunity to get someone with the with the talent as Ben King, as a coach, do you think that you just find a way to make it work? Yeah, I do. I think you do. Um, I mean, if one doesn't get you, the other one will. If you set mm. up right, um, if they both get you on the on the day, um, you know you're you're in real trouble. So. I think you can you can double team and triple team and and, and put some real pressure on uh, one tall, but um, you know one real tall forward who's um, highly athletic and talented. It's, it's very difficult to do it for two. So um, I can understand why some people think, oh no, they're they're sort of like big giraffes, and maybe two of them in the forward line might work. I I, I, I get that, I understand that, but that's where where coaching comes in. Um, so. If St Kilda had a chance to get Ben, I, I wouldn't be saying, oh, no, I think we'd be better off going somewhere else. I mean, he's a great player to have, and I'm sure they'd, they'd perform really well together. They did all during their junior footy career. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Might remind you a little bit of, of Cozzy and Raybot, but hopefully they, if we do get Benny, they get on the park a little bit more than just the 40 games under yeah. your era. All right, JT, we've got an interesting question here. Um, I think you might be familiar with the the person who's who's posing the question. Jordan's asking who your favourite daughter is. <laughs> <laughs> I've got four. Um, uh, who's my favourite? Ali's, Ali's really been good lately, so she's probably got her neck in front at the moment. Uh, Casey's very consistent, always very good. Uh, Holly can be a bit of a bit of a shit stir at times and make it difficult. <laughs> Jordan likes to know she's the most intelligent and uh, and loves arguing with me to try and prove a point the whole time. But uh, 
she's yet to win an argument, which is which is good news for me. But if she's obviously listening, I'll have one an argument with her as soon as I get off here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll win that. Good question, Jordan. Love it. <laughs> yeah, right. there's a bit of family debate over the the dinner table come Sunday, Arvo. Uh, this this Sunday. Um, this Sunday. What's this Sunday? Oh, I'm just. That's that's typically when when families do their yeah. their regular match ups and things like that. Well, we had 17 here for all over the Anzac Day weekend. You know, with eight kids and partners. Um, and the uh, grandchild, there's sort of 16 of us in the grand, so 17. Uh, well, yeah, that, that's not unusual. It's just um, <laughs> it's usually with eight kids, you got plenty of uh, action all around the place the whole time. And uh, yeah, we all love the footy, and um, uh, we get around and have have uh, have uh, some lovely food. We have got some good chefs in the family, and a um, uh, glass of wine, and um, chat about all things so it's, it's great fun it's better than some quality family time yeah never a boring moment i'm i'm guessing in your household ever i mean people either uh come in here and they uh you can see their mouths open and go how long has this been going on and they either love it or they <laughs> run off screaming up the street never to be seen again <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'm sure we can continue talking all night uh, and, you know, you guys can keep posing questions to GT and, and he can keep answering them all night, but we'll, we'll wind it down to the last couple or so. Um, Beth's wondering, GT, if you can see a day where Rui rejoins the Saints coaching staff. Yeah, I don't think so. I think he's firmly entrenched in business and that's where his uh, direction is. He wants to uh, build a business and... <clears throat> and and everything and I, I think that's where his um focus is and Rui is such a self-driven person um I'm not certain that that would be um stimulating enough for him or where he'd want to be he'd be great to come in and mentor he would be great to come in and give some do some sessions uh and he'd be fantastic to mentor the leadership group. Um, um, I remember back in 2003 or four. I can't remember which year it was, um, when Shane Warne got suspended for that silly drug thing, which uh, was all a mistake, but he was, just, he was suspended for a year and we got Shane to head up our leadership group, which worked out very, very well. And, Rui would be fantastic at that at the Saints, doing some stuff like that, but uh, I don't think coaching is uh, where his interest is. Yeah, for, look, he, yeah, look, he seems, I think, as you said, he, he seems happy in the media, he seems happy doing business, and obviously he's taken that that year away to, to spend in Houston with his wife and kids. Um, it'd be awesome to see him at, at Linton Street, but I don't think that's where his heart lies right now. Uh, no, uh, well, his heart's definitely in St Kilda. I know that a hundred percent, but uh, <clears throat> it's not necessarily on the coaching staff. Um, I think yes. he's just a mad Saints supporter and would help and contribute in any way, shape, or form he could. But yeah, all right. Beth's got another another good question for you, GT. Um, just wondering if you take any pride in seeing some of these Saints veterans return to pass on their wisdom to younger players at the club. It seems the cohesiveness of that group of retired players has a bit to do with this coaching team being such an early success, in her opinion. Yeah, I'm very proud to <clears throat> possibly have had some small, minor uh, contribution to their makeup and, um, um, and coaching style and management style and, and everything else. I think they learned a fair, fair bit. Um, during our time uh, over those six years or so, and uh, um, and hopefully they're putting it to good to good use. But yeah, it's, it's you, you get a bit chuffed when you see players you coach that go on to you know um, have great playing careers, and also um, whether they go in the media or whether they go into uh, um, um, coaching, um, you know, it, it makes you feel good that you've had some involvement or some. 
Uh, maybe it's that, you know, whatever Tomo did, let's do the opposite. It might be that, who knows? But, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's, it's uh, been valuable for all of us. Uh, well, we'll just do probably one more question um, and then we'll wrap things up. Bem's asking GT who the most underrated player was during your coaching tenure. The most underrated player. Oh, I hate these questions. Uh, um, I just don't like doing them because I just I just hate focusing on individuals. Um, and it's been a big bugbear of mine that we do at St Kilda all the time. We ask about individuals, but. Uh, who was the most underrated player? Um, <clears throat> look, there's probably been a few. I think Stevie Baker was underrated. Um, got the job done. Jason Blake was underrated. Um, Brett Voss was massively underrated. Uh, his courage was scary. Uh, Matt McGuire was underrated. I thought he he, he was a, a really good, uh, really good player that didn't get the attention of a lot of the others. Um, and you know, uh, they're probably the most. I mean, the other other ones were just the obvious, uh, who who were highly rated. You know, you got players like Fraser Garrick, who, gee whiz, like you know, on his day at his best, there was no better player in the competition at a period of time. Like he was the most dynamic and dominant player in the competition at a at a point. So he had sort of fluctuations in in his approach to the game sometimes and um, phrase, but uh, gee whiz, when he was on song, he was unbeatable and uh, an incredibly good player. Um, and all the other guys that were there, you talk about the Hamels and the Kaziskis and the Balls and the Revolts and, and, and uh, Del Santos and Montagnas and uh, these guys, uh, they're all, you know, well regarded, highly rated players. But I think those few I mentioned were the guys that used to, um, and Milne, of course, he was, you know, did a great, great job. But um, I think those few I mentioned were always flying under the radar and didn't get the attention. Luke Penny was another guy, very underrated. Yeah, I love that you are uh, that you mentioned Stevie Baker in there. He was the the ultimate bodyguard for you, for your A class midfielders. I don't think there was a, a better tagger in the comp, and probably there there won't ever will be. Um, just just the last question to, to wrap it up and we'll let you go after this. We'd love to know um, what your best moment or your, your funniest moment was um, coaching the St Kilda Footy Club. Um, <clears throat> the best moment. Um, uh, I don't know what the best moment was. Um, the funniest moment was at the Bar Calabria over in Perth. Uh, uh, after I got, I got fined 20 grand during the week uh, for giving some sage advice to the umpires, which uh, they took the wrong way. And, uh, and then we went over to, uh, that was on the Wednesday, I think, and then we went to Perth and uh, we, um, uh, the umpires come into the rooms before the game, but this particular day they walked in in single file, walked up there. <laughs> walked out the single file and <clears throat> and that was pretty funny because they didn't say one word they didn't shake one hand they were really pissed off really pissed off and then five minutes into the game um, it was just a joke you just see it happening and um, the cameras come up to me in the coach's box and sit next to Matty Randell my assistant and we're both laughing our heads off we just <laughs> we believe it. this is just a joke what's happening here and uh uh, we got beaten by a kick after the siren. Long, long we were kicked the, from the boundary line and kicked the, kicked the goal to, to beat us. And uh, that's where that whole whispers in the skies thing started. But that was pretty funny. And I think the other funny thing, it was against Freo as well, is that um, siren gate down in Tassie. That was funny. I guess. But, mm. you know, coach, uh, Chris Connolly on the ground and Swab, the GM, uh, running around on the ground when the game was still going. It was... Oh, that, that was uh, that was the you know, debacle of the time too. Yeah, uh, no, nah, it's awesome that you can you can look back on those moments and you can have, have whatever feelings you want about them. But at least you you sit back and laugh now because ultimately it was was a bit of a game. But no, nah, it's it's awesome that you can you can sit back and and see the light in those moments and and not 
I don't know, I guess hang on to them as, as other people may may do so. Excellent. Well, thanks for your time, guys. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to have a chat with you and uh, you're doing a great job and keep up the good work and look forward to seeing the your show get bigger and better as time goes on. Awesome. Oh, Thank awesome. you so much, JT. We appreciate your time as well. All awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good one. See ya. Wow, so that what was a, JT. What a treat that was. What a treat that was. Oh, it's always good to, to have an ex St Kilda coaching member join us. Um, yeah, and we thank Grant for his time. He was very, very kind to, to give up his Tuesday night to come join us, come answer our questions, come answer your questions. And, yeah, awesome. You know, coaching a bit a bit before our time. I think you mentioned that we might not have been born when he was coaching. Uh, we were in nappies. Born in 03, we are probably in the cots um, during the prelim final against against Port Adelaide where we lost by six points. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, nah, mate, we were in nappies. We were, we were around. <laughs> we were alive. Um, but, yeah, that was GT. Now, yes. just um, we're, we're trending towards the end of the show, but before we do, I think it's important to... To acknowledge the the big Friday night blockbuster, as some might call it, I'm certainly calling it that. You know, let leave me be. Friday night blockbuster against Port Adelaide, seven yeah, fifty so- p.m. at Marvel. That's going to be a huge game, isn't it? Yeah, it will be. Um, potential to go six and one. Um, few key outs for um, sorry, um, few key outs for Port Adelaide. No Tom Jonas with a one match suspension. Georgiades, who usually plays pretty well against us, has unfortunately torn his ACL playing Sandful last week. Um, there's probably someone else that I'm forgetting, um, but nevertheless, uh, might go, we might go into to key matchups. Who who is the biggest threat right now uh, for Port Adelaide moving into Friday night, Jordan? Uh, I think it's either one of Connor Rosie or Ollie Wines. I think both have been in. Especially Rosie has been in tremendous form and it will certainly take some stopping of those two. Do you think Jack Bytel should go to Ollie Wines? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because, yes, he had 38 touches in the VFL, but I'm also, I don't think it does a player any confidence just going one week in Sandy, one week in St Kilda, one week in St. Like, just keep going back and forth like that. I'm not sure if that's the best for a player's confidence and also to get a good string of form because if you, you're going 100% just about time on ground in the VFL, but then you're only getting, I don't know, 20 minutes, maybe a quarter in the AFL, who, who knows if that's if that's going to get enough continuity for him to continue playing. Um, I'm not sure if we tag anyone because as we saw this week, Cripps, Handball Galore, um, Walsh, Blake Aker's got a fair bit of the pill. There was a lot of players. Harry Mackay is a key forward. I think touched the ball 18 times. Um, our zone seems to be set up so well behind the ball that if teams can just keep their disposals in that back half of the ground, then look, we look like we'll be in pretty good shape, I think. Yeah, I think you're right on that point. Um, I know a couple of Saints fans off air have mentioned that maybe we should tag... Jason Horn Francis as well. I think you made a good point with Cripps and, and guys like Chera and Walsh having a lot of touches in the back half and having just uncontested handballs. Um, you know, we limit the effectiveness of them, um, you know, if they're not if they're not making those handballs dangerous inside fifty, then you know, there's no point in tagging them. The key matchup for me, I'd say, would be Charlie Dixon. I think we've got to send Callum Wilkie to him. I think that's a no brainer. Charlie Dixon, no matter what your thoughts on him are, I think he has the potential to take over a game. I personally don't like him. Um, yeah, but that's a topic for another discussion. Oh, ju- yeah, sorry, you- just on that, I'm, I'm on the opposing view that you send Dougal Howard to, to Charlie Dixon, former Port Adelaide teammates, um, and I, th- I think Dougal Howard has now elevated his game another level under this Ross Lyons system. I'm... For me personally, I'd like to see Dougal Howard match up on on Charlie Dixon, and then Wilkie play that supporting role back to an intercepting, intercepting defender. Oh, I think. Well, I'm not so sure about that to be honest, because I think uh, 
do or despite his size, I mean, that's that's definitely a key advantage for him over Wilkes. But I do think Dougal and Charlie are both bit of a, are both hotheads. And I do, do think with Dougal returning, there is a possibility that they get into each other. I think Wilkie working his opponents under the ball and having the strength that he does, I think he's a bit stronger than Howard. And that's going to be really important against a key forward like Charlie Dixon mm. in that Charlie is probably the strongest player in the competition um, and certainly a lot stronger than... Then Charlie Kerno, who relies more on his athleticism last week. So I think that sending sending Wilkie, I'm of the opinion that sending Wilkie to to Dixon is the right call. Sainers, let us know who you think it should be. Should it be Callum Wilkie going to Dixon or do you think it should be Dougal Howard going to Charlie Dixon? Let us know. Hopefully, whichever one it is that Ross decides to send to, to Big Charlie, that, you know, he can be maintained. And speaking of Ross Lyon... <laughs> I think I think he's I think he's prepared eighteen oh, I think he's prepared eighteen months in advance for this game. To be honest, you know he's always talking about how to beat Port Adelaide on Footy Classified, isn't he? Or what? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. No, he, he loved to dissect the uh, the Powers game on on Fox Classified, and yeah, I think Ken Hinckley's got this group pretty in pretty good stead. They've had I mean AFL Media loves to say that they've got the uh, the hardest fixture this year, and you know what they probably do, but. You know, sometimes you, I, I guess you just got to suck it up and you got to play whoever's the, the next opponent ahead of you. Um, something's out of your control. But, yeah, geez, I'd also love to see Kane Collins' reaction to this to this game. Um, I'd love to see what he actually says about the Saints after we play them, whether it's a win, lose or draw, hopefully win, though. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard Kane Collins say something positive about St Kilda, so it would be very interesting. I'd like to see him. Obviously, he's had a, a, a bit of beef Call it what you will, with the godfather, Jake Bertoni in the past. Um, you know, I'd love to see Jake go go one-on-one with Kane Collins at some point and let us know, Sainers, if that is something you want to see. Let Jake know if that's something you want to see. I would love to see that very much because um, I'm sure Jake would have a lot of questions for Mr. Collins and Mr. Collins would maybe not have so many answers for Mr. Bertoni. <laughs> have so many answers for Mr. Bertoni's questions. Um <laughs> Hold on. Xavier's brought up a good point that's worth discussing. He reckons we need a rest deal. It doesn't look 100%. Can we give Bytel a go? You mentioned Max Bytel had a good game in, for Sandy, but you did bring up the point that, you know, you need consistency with players not, you know, bringing them up one week and dropping them the next. I'm personally of the opinion that giving guys games is the best way to get them back into full form. That's also why I wasn't perhaps 100% in terms of returning from injury, that is, maybe not so much on confidence or, or playing well, um, but at least they're returning from injury. If they don't play well the first game, you keep pummeling games into them, and that's why I was a bit disappointed to see Win Hager drop the other week. Do you think we need to give Steele a rest, or do you think he sits up next week? No, I, I definitely think on Friday night he plays. Um, yeah, he looked he looked a bit of it slow, but... I think the days of us just relying on Steele to win the ball and do quite literally everything in the midfield are hopefully they're they're a bit past us. Um, I think what could be a really exciting um, opportunity is already in our makeshift forward line. We're throwing the magnets everywhere it seems on, or Ross Lyons throwing the magnets everywhere on the board, and right now they seem to be sticking. We still haven't seen Steele at his full potential in the forward line. Play him as a high half forward, getting rotating through the midfield as rest. So the so foot main. In, Play him as a main forward, secondary midfielder. If we start getting pummeled in the guts, that's when you throw him straight in there. Or if someone like a Horn Francis, Rosie Butters, whoever it is, starts getting a hold of us, steal to tear because, you know what, even if you're not having the best game in terms of getting the ball, at least you can tackle. Um, I, th- I think back to 2021, I think it was. Um, steal went forward against the Blues. Uh, sorry, the Blues, the Demons kicked three goals and kept us in that game on, on the first Spuds game. So I'd like to see still play a little bit more of a high half forward role, rotate through the midfield and just give him a bit more of a rest on the shoulder. As Ross Lyon said, it was uh, playing against the Blues was a part of his 28-day rehab. So maybe the 28th day is against power and he, he plays more as a forward. Yeah, and he's a beautiful shot for goal in the forward line as well. We oh, know that. Yes, sure. Absolutely. Um, Xavier has noted in the comments that um, he thinks Steele might re the injury. But like Beth, I agree that the, the coaches are probably the best ports of call. I'm sure they've, they've communicated with the doctors um, 
you know, what his needs are. I'm not a medical professional, nor do I profess to be. Um, I do have access to WebMD and the internet, but, you know, that's not, not quite the same as, a, as having a doctorate, although some people nowadays seem to think it is. Um, but, yeah, Xavier and Beth, I think, I think that, um, you know, it's good to have trust in the coaches and I think that Steel will be fine. Um, yeah, so we're probably trending towards the end here, Sainers, but just one word, Max, can you describe, can you give us one word for how you're feeling for for Friday night? And Sainers, why don't you give us one word in the comment section? Yeah, please, Sainers, pop through your comments because uh, I think I say nerve-sided nerve every week or excited every week, but I just, yeah, please, Sainers, send, send through your comments. I might just try and snag one of yours. Um, I think we need a GoFundMe for Max to buy a thesaurus. <laughs> need some new words, this guy. Yeah, yeah. Buy me a thesaurus. I need it. Um, Rod says confident. Nick says you're Dr. Saints in response to the medical professionals. So, yeah, I think we are the Dr. Saints. And you know what? Hopefully most of the coaches now at St Kilda, after managing the St Kilda Hospital for the first six weeks of the season, are, are medical experts themselves. Themselves. Adam's ready. That's Natalie's funny. excited. But Max, what's your what's your word? Uh, Jordan, I'm gonna handball it off to you. What's your word? <laughs> you don't have one ready. That's no. all right. I'll save you. I'll save you. Um, my word's pumped. I'm super excited for this game. Ooh, to be perfectly fun. honest with you, Maxi, um, I reckon we'll win. That that shouldn't come as a surprise to many. Um, but I'm just really looking forward to seeing. I don't, I don't like Port Adelaide as many people don't like Port Adelaide. Just looking forward to seeing how we can beat uh, another good team because Port Adelaide are four and two at the moment. I have them in, or I had them in my top eight before the season started. I still have them in my top eight, and they are still in the top eight on the current AFL ladder. So I'd love nothing more than to to knock them off. So Max, what's your what's your key word? I am not joking when I say this. I have pulled up the thesaurus. Um, a few a few synonyms for excited are thrilled, exhilarated, elevated. Um, let's go. Uh, let's go thrilled. No, that's not the right one. I'm, I'm exhilarated. I'm I'm hyped up. I'm hyped up for uh for Friday night's contest. You could almost say you're pumped, which is exactly <laughs> what I said. But you know, that's a, we'll we'll let you we'll let it slide on this one, Sainers. Actually, you know what, Sainers, let us know if we should let it slide. Let us know if Max needs to up his. <laughs> His choice of words uh, is, well, his one word choice for next week. And I'm sure he'll come prepared next time. Right. Score line prediction. Surely no. you can deliver this one. Yeah, I can. De <laughs> yeah, I can deliver this one. Um, I reckon Saints or win by about 34 points. Um, St Kilda 88, Port Adelaide 54. This guy. This guy <laughs> has just... We've got a we've got a document written down with all our key points for the show, and he's just absolutely gone and, and tried to mug me off here by reading my exact score that I've written down, just because he doesn't have he was jealous about the one word that he had earlier. Oh my oh my lord, that's a cardinal sin, Maxi. All hey, right, you know well, I'm hey, just going to say know. then. Uh, yeah, you go. Yeah, I don't want to hear it. Beth has my support. We'll send you a feelings, will Max? Oh, I love it, Beth. All right, well then. You know what, Max? I'm just going to say St Kilda 89 defeat Port Adelaide 53 <laughs> and we win by 36 points instead. So, throw it up and jump up. All right. Well, maybe, maybe, hopefully don't steal my one on this one, but but play to have a big game. Oh, play to have a, uh, a, a proper big game. Um, I'd love to see... Oh, who, who is South Australian players? I'd love to see Dougal Howard have a big game. Yeah, Just when you said to... South Australian, I thought you were really going to take mine again. I was really waiting for oh, it. No, mine's, uh, mine's, mine's, yeah, mine's the Po, mine's Filippo. Um, obviously, South Australian, I reckon he's obviously a bloke who has huge confidence and knows that a lot of South Australians will be watching and playing a South Australian team. I reckon this is, well, it's prime time on television, but it's also prime time for the, the Po train, the missile, as I'm trying to, Trying to get more and more people to to start calling him that, and help, help me catch, help me get this nickname caught on, guys. Um, hopefully, it catches on at some point. But yeah, hopefully the missile has a great game. Well, I think he'll have a great game on Friday night, but also hopefully he does. I think I'm a bit tired after waking up at three ish in the morning for the dawn service. 
yeah, I, I don't think you've mentioned that you woke up at uh, at 3 a.m. this morning, Jordan. I, that, I think that's slipped over my head. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we'll leave it there, Sainers. Well, we might just leave it there, Sainers. Yep, just a, just a reminder to check out the podcast, Jake's Weekly TV, um, and there should be a preview up either to, no, uh, either tomorrow night or Thursday night when the fixtures release. Um, so yeah, stay tuned and, and you know what, rewatch rewatch this live stream with with GT on. It was uh, a pleasure having him. Yep, good as always to have GT on. Guys, noted if the the scoreline prediction's even close, he owes us both a beer. We might just take you up on that one, guy, given the price of alcohol these days. Um, but as always, thank you guys for watching. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday night and have a great week. Go the Saners. See you guys next time.